uh, uh, to a stanza of that song. Um, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Amen. So y'all sing it with me, all right? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. One more time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, pure and holy. Tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Let us bow our heads. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you right now for your grace and for your mercy. We praise you, God, for this the day you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We're thankful to you, Lord God, because you've been good to us. God, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. We thank you, Lord God, because you bless us, O God, to come into the house of prayer one more time. We thank you, Lord God, because you allowed us to come, Lord God, in our right mind with the activity of our limbs. We praise you, O God, because we're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus tonight. We thank you, O God, for the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. We thank you, O God, because without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. And so we appreciate, amen, the finished work of Calvary. Thank you, O God, because of the finished work of Calvary, we've been blood washed. We've been justified. We've been cleansed. Oh, God, we've been sanctified. My God, by the Holy Ghost. And we thank you, my God, for what you've done and what you're going to do. Father, I pray now in the name of the Lord Jesus, God, that you would touch the hearts and minds of your people, those that are here in the sanctuary and those that are in the virtual sanctuary and those that are on their way, Lord God, to the physical sanctuary. I pray, oh, God, you hasten their steps. And, Lord God, I pray, oh, God, you anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. Remember those that are on the prayer list, oh God. Remember those that are sick and those that are afflicted, those that need deliverance, those that need healing, those that need salvation. God, God, those that need help, I pray, oh God, you extend your hand of mercy and your hand of grace. Let your will be done. Let your name be praised. You be glorified and all that's said and all is done. I pray your choices, blessings be upon us, oh God. Um, anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive the ingratitude word of God. We might live and grow thereby. And these blessings we ask Ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Come on, say amen again. Amen. And so, before uh, I clean off the mic, I want to say praise the Lord again to everyone that's here. We thank the Lord for what he's done and what he's going to do. And so here, uh, this is Financial Literacy Month, and so I want to uh, talk about finances God's way. And uh, the... Uh, singles ministry had uh, Deacon Hines from Christ Church of Deliverance here. Amen. He did a presentation, I believe it was back in February. Amen. And uh, on a Saturday. And so it was very uh, good information. And the Lord just dropped on my mind to do, amen, finances his way. And so I'm encouraging the saints to come in. Those that are online, uh, he'll be doing this for the next two weeks. Uh, outside of today, and so I'm encouraging us to be here uh, and tell someone uh, to join us and uh, so we can hear what God has to say to us about our finances. Amen? And so without further ado, I want us to receive uh, in a Beulah Heights fashion, amen, as we receive Deacon Arnell Hines from Christ Church of Deliverance. He'll come in his own way. Can we say amen? amen. Come on, let's greet him and say Amen.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Good evening, good evening. I wonder if uh, you certainly you don't have to sit way in the, uh, the, the, the high bleacher section. You know, this is a game that you didn't have to pay to be here, so you can certainly move closer if you like to. So unless you paid for those seats way back there, and that's all right if you did that. Uh, we, we thank the Lord for, for being here tonight. It's really, this is a first for me. Um, certainly have done presentations before, but, you know, with Sister Jennifer and, and, you know, your pastor inviting us or allowing us to come during the singles event, we, we've done that seminar plenty of times before, but not on a Bible class night. And so I certainly want to thank God and honor uh, your pastor, Elder Brooks, for allowing me to be here on a Wednesday night, a Bible class night. We have Bible class at Christ Church on Wednesday nights in, in Hartford. And so Bishop Jackson uh, allowed me, afforded me the opportunity to be here with you guys for the next few weeks, if you'll have me next week and a week after. Uh, um, but I don't take it lightly because, you know, the presentation that we did with the singles was more, you know, I won't say worldly, but it's practical knowledge and um, but it did there is there was a spin on it saying God's way right and so um, but to deal with scripture as I was telling someone coming down here tonight I never treat it lightly I mean we can talk about everything outside of the word and be free with those kinds of things but when it comes to opening this book and pointing you to a scripture I don't care if it was a familiar passage of scripture as some say it's still not to be taken lightly. And so I treat it a high, high honor that Pastor Brooks has allowed me to come to take over a, a, a Wednesday night Bible class. Um, and Lady Brooks as well, we certainly give honor to you as, as well. And, you know, to all the saints and, and certainly to the, the ministers here, the staff here. But again, it's, it's, it's a high honor. It really is to me. I'm blown away. I may not show it, but on the inside, man, from the toes to the top of my head, I'm just... Wow. Um, so we hope that we can say something in these next few weeks to be a blessing to you. I can tell you of a truth that I'm still being blessed by not just a preparation, but ever since Sister Jennifer Canada um, invited us to the singles event. And the difference was she put the topic saying it was money or finances God's way. Like I said, I've done this from in my profession, um, doing these seminars. Uh, dealing with money and debt elimination, those kinds of things. And though the, the, the premise was from a gentleman who really has faith-based background, it's, it's still a help and a blessing. But it's a whole different thing when you say God's way. Because now your senses need to wake up a little bit and, and say, okay, I can walk, I can talk, I can chew gum, but how do I do that God's way? And so there's a, a huge seriousness when it comes to that. And we're going to try to have some fun tonight. Um, but but if I can digress a moment, I was just thinking even Sunday about this song, and it just stayed on my mind. I'm not going to sing it, but it's an old song. Wonderful, wonderful, Jesus is to me. Ah, counselor, prince of peace, mighty God is he, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my redeemer. Oh, praise his name. Hallelujah. I thank God for that song. We haven't even sung it in a long time, but for some reason it just hit me Sunday and I, it just, it stayed with me. I haven't even sung it. It's just, the words just stayed with me. You know, sometimes you just got to slow it down and take it word for word, understand what the words are saying, and then you can appreciate even more. So this topic is, as Pastor Brooks talked about um, sharing with you, is something, as I said to the singles, that we don't talk about enough. We really don't. Um, all of us in here, from whatever age, it doesn't matter. We don't talk about money and finances enough. I mean, have conversation. We will talk about money, but we don't talk about it from a a financial standpoint, asking questions of one another. I can tell you that we, uh, you know, we got a new pair of shoes. We're going shopping this weekend, grocery shopping, even vacations, right? Houses, cars, things. But we don't talk about, yeah, I, I saved up for that so I can go on that vacation. Um, I did what I needed to do so that I'm not in debt because of that, that I'm paying for it. I, I, I waited my time. I took the time to do these things. And so because the people we're talking to may be learning from you and I. Right? How did you get that? Did you just go off and go get it? And are you in debt because of it? Are you debt free? How did you do that? We don't 
And then the receiver of you telling us that you're doing these things, we don't ask the question because maybe we feel like, well, I shouldn't get in your business, right? But you let me in your business when you told me I'm going on that vacation, I'm buying a pair of shoes, I'm going shopping this weekend and, and those kind of things. So you lend an opportunity for me to say, well, how is it that you're doing what you're doing? I may not be able to do it like you, but I'm going to learn perhaps how you do it because if you waited and saved up your money, then maybe the same thing I may want, I now know I'm encouraged now because you waited. I can, I can wait too, right? Why go into debt when you can just put some money aside and do those things, right? And so we don't have the full conversation enough, and certainly as people, us, right, we don't. But we're not the only ones. It's all races that don't have the conversations enough about money and finances, how to do it so that we don't bring the stress along with it. Listen, you got any, anybody get anything new in the last couple of weeks? Just show of hands. If you purchase anything new, I don't care if it was the smallest of things. Okay, good, hands, right? You paid for it or are you paying on it? Um, right? You feel for, paid, thank you, thank you paid for it, right? It feels good when we pay for a thing, right? It just, it just feels good. But I don't care how new a thing is, how, how old it is or whatever. The fact is that we took the time to do what it was that we needed to do and not go into debt. And hopefully you have the thing and you don't have stress with that, right? You bought the brand new thing in the last couple of weeks. And if there's stress along with that, then maybe, hold up, we didn't do it right. And if there's stress with it, I can guarantee you we didn't do it God's way. We didn't do it his way, okay? Because the scripture says, the blessings of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow to it. There's no labor when God's doing the thing, right? You ain't got to work for it. You just have to be in position for it, <laughs> right? You just have to be in position for it. And so God won't bless us and then say, okay, now I'm going to make you work for it. You already gave it to me if he gave it to us, right? So we can check one another, right? Now we in everybody's business. We're in each other's business. If you see us struggling with that new car that we're rolling around in, then, then, then you can know and pretty much believe that God wasn't in all of that. He might have been in a portion of it, but it, it maybe he was saying, wait, but you did it right now. But you're struggling to pay for it. Or I'm struggling, right? I'm not, I'm not excluded in these conversations, okay? So you're going to hear me say we a lot and because I'm in this thing too. We're not here to throw out. We're here to share out, okay? So, again, um, I, I want to also say here too as we get into this that I was here last week, and I thank God that the Lord allowed me to be here. I wish that I could have made it right on time, but it caught some traffic. And, but we were here in enough time. Probably around this time last week we made it in the building and I want to tell you, uh, the, the saints here, that what I heard your pastor preaching or teaching on, um, I agree 100% with. Amen. He talked about tithing, and I learned a couple of things, uh, confirmed a few things that I had in my notes. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Check that box. Check that box, right? Let me know I was even on the right track. But I learned some things that he shared, and I agree 100% with the things that he taught and shared. And I'm not a member here but I'm still of the body of Christ. And, and, and I want to thank God. I'm not trying to put feathers in caps, but I certainly want to say I really thank God for, for Pastor Brooks because, because we don't talk about this enough and to ha you to have a pastor that wants to share about tithing and money and finances, doing it God's way. Again, they, the preachers, can preach all kinds of things, but many of them, most of them, you are, you've hardly heard take the time out like he's taking the time out to allow for this series, but also what he taught on last week. And so you ought to really appreciate your pastor as I appreciate your pastor for being able to, uh, to offer that to the congregation. He wants the best for you. He wants the best for you. All right. And I was blessed to be a part of that last week and I thank God uh, for it. And so um, we're going to pick up where he ended on some of the things he talked about. Um, and so I broke this, this series down in a few phases. Um, the, the first phase tonight, we'll, we'll do some le lecture. Next week will also be some lecture and scripture. Um, tonight we'll talk about some money management and the whole premise of finances and money God's way. 
Next week, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, we'll touch on some things and get in a little bit deeper on others, on budgets, uh, financial planning, estate planning, uh, retirement planning. Uh, we hope to maybe have some materials to hand out to you and to encourage you to seek um, some financial advice from licensed and practiced financial advisors if you don't already have one. Um, so we're going to see what we can bring next week to, to be a handout. And then finally, we're going to end with something that really should have been next week, but we're going we're gonna to wait on it, um, is uh, what we share with the singles, and that's what dealing with debt elimination. Uh, because again, we can talk about how to save and budget and, and do financial planning and retirement planning, but how are you going to save and you in debt? Right? I'm still going to change that. How are we going to save and we in debt? But we do it, right? Um, we don't clear the debt, but we certainly want to put away retirement and things like that. But one thing I want to put in your mind, and I have notes here. Forgive me. I'm going to read some things, but I'm going to come off script on a couple of things. Um, one of the things I want us to see now before we get to the last series is, can you imagine whatever debt you have, you no longer have that debt, and all that money goes right to your bank account for you to then do what it is that you want and or need to do. I, I, I don't need an acknowledgement, but I wanted to pause, do a little c -law moment there because I want you and I to think about that. We, we run day in and day out. Some of us are retired now, but we've run day in and day out working and making money and we just do the whole thing all over again every day for as long as we, we work and the Lord blesses us to work. But we do it in a fashion where we don't even think about the fact that um, we don't have to be in debt. Right? We're just accustomed to, you know, because we don't talk about it. Our parents didn't tell us too much about it. Those that did, thank God for those parents, right? But many didn't do that and don't do that, right? They're happy with our, our, our success and, you know, we, we get things. They're happy for us. But they don't even ask us, well, you in debt with that kind of thing, right? And it, it just we don't have those conversations. And so we need to start. Right. As a people, we need to start. And certainly as God's people, we definitely need to start. But we need to start with him, too. Lord, how do you want me to spend the money you bless me with? OK, so I don't mind tonight. Again, this is a Bible session and series. Uh, I'm an interactive person, so I do receive and, and, and um, solicit feedback. You can ask questions, um, but there are some things I do want to get through. So if I don't get to call on you, what I am asking for you to do is write down some questions, write down thoughts or things that you may have wanted to share with me. I know we didn't premise that or, or preface that. Uh, you might not have notepads and paper, but if you do, this is Bible class. You ought to have something to write down on or put in your notes or whatever. I can share my uh, phone number with you if you want. You can text me. I would love to know what questions you may have because I would like to address those, whether I send information back to pastor to share if it's even after this series, right? But I would like to make sure that if whatever questions you have get answered. I'm not the answer guy, but I can get the answers uh, for you, okay? Um, so uh, I would also love to tell you that this is going to be a fun series. Um, uh, I made some promises during the singles event, and so I'm promising a couple things tonight. I promise to do my best to make it fun. Uh, but this is a serious topic because, again, when you talk about money, folks get kind of like, well, you know, you're talking about my money. You know, you leave, you know, deal with your own self and just don't talk about my money, right? So we, we get a little deep. We get a little personal. Um, so I promise you uh, I will be very direct. Um, and deliberate in uh, my presentations. If we receive it, we, here's that first of the we, we will surely learn and grow from it and we'll become much better at money management God's way. Please note that I'm saying we, though I'm presenting, I'm in no way excluding myself from this presentation and from this series, all right? I am definitely still in it too. I haven't made it to the mountaintop, but I certainly have been helped by the Lord, and, and the little that he has helped me has been much in my life and in my wife's life. Uh, so again, phase one, scripture and lecture. Uh, as Pastor said, April is Financial Literacy Month. I didn't even know it until he invited me. I don't really pay attention to what months represent what and that kind of thing, but hey, it's Financial Literacy Month, y'all. Um, and the intent, the intent for Financial Literacy Month is to raise public awareness of the importance of financial literacy and maintaining smart money management habits in four fundamental categories, debt, budgeting, saving, and investing. Debt, budgeting, savings, and investing. And so for the first scripture tonight, I want to go to 2 Corinthians 5.17. I would love for you to join me there. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 is a scripture that we definitely know. All right, we've heard it many, many times before, but I guarantee we've, we've, we've not put it in the context of where we're going tonight. We've not, we've not put it in the context of money management. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17. Right. Are there some readers in Beulah? <laughs> There's some readers. <laughs> she called out Sister Tony. <laughs> All right. All right. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. One more time, please. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Thank you. All things are become new. In, in this series of dealing with money and finances God's way, we have to look at a whole new way of how we do what we do how we've done what we've done. When we come into Christ, I've come to believe, and I embrace the fact that everything that I do or we do, after being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, it's a direct reflection on just how saved we are. Our salvation depends upon our thoughts and actions every day because salvation is a lifestyle. It's not what you did when you went down in the water that day. It's what you do after, every day after. And so because of that, all things becoming new, I can't do what I did the same way I used to do it. Let me say that again. When I got saved, when you and I got saved, we can't continue to do the things that we used to do before we got saved, the way we used to do it. And that includes how we deal with our finances. But guess what? Nobody ever talked to us about this. Nobody ever told us, okay, now that you're saved, you got to handle your money differently. Right? It may have been an, an implication or implied that, hey, you know all things are new, so you got to do it differently. But no one said it to us. And some of us are so wise that we'll tell our pastor, well, you never told me that. But listen, but you still should know. <laughs> right? Just because I told you you shouldn't be shacking up, you should know now in this new life you don't shack up. All right? I ain't going to go down all those roads. But again, we're talking about a new life in Christ. And we just can't do the things that we did the same way we did them before. Unless we were pleasing God in those things, we should maintain that lifestyle. But everything we did before we got saved, we weren't pleasing the Lord. Okay? So when it comes to this, and I believe this, and I'm embracing it. And again, we walk daily with Christ. We live daily. We make mistakes still. We're human beings, right? And so we, but, but thank God, his grace and mercy allows us to repent if we want to repent. And he forgives us to help us to live a life that's pleasing in his sight. So all things have become new. And so again, how we handle our money and manage our money and finances is no exception. Listen, it's a testimony to the world of God's goodness to us and our faithfulness to him and what he's given us. So then if we don't handle our money God's way, then what does not managing our money God's way testify of? If what we do every day is a testimony to the God that we say we serve, then if I don't handle my money and finances right, and then I'm struggling, and I'm telling my coworkers and neighbors and family, God, you know, we're trying to help our family be saved, but they see us, right? And, like, why would I want what you got? Because you don't seem like you're doing any better than I am, <laughs> Okay? But we can still be transparent with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it, and I'm letting the Lord work on it, on me for this, right? But then they got to see it because life, because salvation is a lifestyle. So even if you said nothing to me, the life that you live in front of me, I'm already seeing it. You're already talking. But you're struggling, and, you know, we're trying to hide and not let folks know that we're struggling. Don't you know all these folks in here, we can pray for one another? We don't have a judge and the jury, unless some of us practice the law, and, the, and if we moved, it, moved all the way up to the place of a judge, we don't have that seat to sit in. So when I tell you my issues, you cannot judge me in that respect. But I, I expect for you to pray and encourage me. 
right? I received encouragement on the way down here from one of the gentlemen, the first that I was talking to. And I'm like, Lord, thank you. Right? Just, I mean, you, you never know where it's going to come. But when we have so great a cloud of witnesses, th then, then half the cloud shouldn't be one that's going to judge us and, and knock us down. We should have way more than half the crowd that's really trying to build one another up, right? Because we're in this thing together. If I'm now in your family and you're in my family, <laughs> okay? So what does not managing God's uh, money God's way, what does that testify of, right? So I'm going to pick up um, some from what Pastor Brooks' uh, lesson was on tithing. Got to hit that. I think that's the first thing we should start with, right? Um, the tithing or a tenth. Uh, we are to present 10% of our gross wages to God. And I underlined and highlighted and, and capitalized gross wages. And I need to roll up and park here because I understand. I do. I have a tax business. So I have clients, right? I have business clients. I have regular 1040, uh, 10 W2 clients. And I have some church clients, I'm not part of the administrative team at Christ Church, so I don't see the contribution as that everybody does every year. But when you are my client, you come to me. If you give me that contribution envelope, then I see what you do. And I got to tell you, um, the few clients that I have, when I see their contribution envelopes, some of them, I'm like, thank you, Lord, because the W-2 is X amount. Their, their contribution is more than a tenth. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. And, and the, unfortunately, the majority that I see is well below what the W-2 says. And I'm like, how are we doing this God's way? How are we honoring God? Like, we're going to get into some of this here, too, but it's not a tenth. Ten percent of the gross. We that work and have worked, we get a wage, right? That gross wage, say you, you work for your 40 hours and it's $1,000. I'm, I'm, hopefully it's way more than 1000 but it's $1,000. That's the top. That's the gross amount. Then you have your taxes. You have your benefits. Then you got that net thing, which is what goes into your bank account. So now you got maybe $700, $800 that goes to your bank. That's not what we tithe on. We don't tithe on the seven, 700 and give $70 or $80. Ain't no amens, but a couple of that's rights. Mm-hmm. But that's all right. We going, we going in. <laughs> we going in. All right. Um, so let me just look at my notes here. The gross is before taxes and benefits are taken out. God gets his portion off the top, not on what's left. And you and I have heard, if we've been in this long enough, we've heard somebody say, if God ain't first, he's not going to be last. We don't give God what's left, you know, what they say, the sloppy leftovers. And no, no, -uh. what's left is what we know. He blessed us and he gets his first off the top. So if you have a thousand dollars gross, how much is that in tithe? You that can do some math in your head. Huh? Hundred dollars. Everybody agree? All right. Thank you, Lord. You're getting a hundred dollars tithe. All right. So then we have one that we, we have uh, our net is eight hundred dollars. How much do we give in tithes? Huh? No. Uh -uh. We don't know if it's a hundred because it could have been. I'm saying the net is eight eight hundred. It could have been twelve hundred dollars as your gross. So the right answer with that would be, well, it depends on what the gross was. Right. We don't tithe God on the on the net. Mm -mm. Uh uh. No, sir. Nope. We, we tithe him on whatever the gross is, the top, right? I love this, this. I wrote it as a quote, but it's what pastor said last week. Tithing is a test of the heart. Where's your heart? <laughs> Where's your heart, right? In the scripture that said where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be, right? Where is your heart? It's a test of the heart, and I agree with that. Tithing is also an act of worship and faith or trust. He said that as, a, as an act of, of trust. It's an act of worship and faith and trust as well. Again, salvation is a lifestyle. So what I do is a worship to God every single day, right? It's not just up here in the choir stand. It's not just in the congregational singing. You know, worship is what I do. There's a song that says that, right? Yeah, Praise is what I do. 
But the, the whole worship thing is how I live in my life it pleasing to God. We are a worship to him. But that's everything we do. That's in money and finances. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look, we got a question already. He even moved closer for that one. So We tithe from the gross. Yes, sir. But when you retire, what do you tithe from? And, and if we say in 5%, where do the 5% comes from if you tithe from gross from mm -hmm. all the years you don't work? This is, this is a, uh, probably going to be the top question of this entire series. And I thank God for Elder Blongo uh, asking that question. Here's how I'm going to answer it. See your pastor. I, and, and I'm not trying to be funny with that because I asked my bishop some questions yesterday that I wanted clarity on. I even asked a question. My wife and I were talking. I'll just share this, but in, in the context of where we're going with this. Um, she asked me, she said, so, honey, if people don't pay tithes, are they going to hell? She asked a question. I said, well, you know, let's, let's look at it, okay? Let's try to see what the scripture says, and is there a command? Because pastor last week, um, Melchizedek, uh, uh, um, um, Abraham gave to Melchizedek before there was even a law, right? So, so there was no law or command to even do that, but he did that, right? And then you have scriptures after the fact, after the law, where even Jacob had said, too, that before the law, that I'm going to give all that you're given to me, I'm going to give a tenth to you, Right? So, so in the response that I got from my pastor, he was saying, well, it depends on the teaching, right? And what he said was that there's some that believe in 5%. There's some to deal with the 10th, okay? It depends on what teaching you're going to get. So I cannot answer that question to give you exactly what to do. That has to come from the leader of the church. And so in my last, one of my last responses to him, I said, wow, it must be really something among the leaders of churches to have to handle and to, to address this issue. Because if you go, if you try to say before law, or some may say because of the law, we're not really under the law, we're under grace, right? And so some may say, well, that was for that time. Well, what is for this time, right? So it's just best. And, and so in, in his response, he says, I'm going to teach 10%, right? And so I said, well, I'm going to follow that. And I've been following that. I'm not retired yet. But so the, the best answer is to really seek, you know, guidance from your leadership because to be able, because of the fact that it can be different from churches to churches, states to states, right? And so I would love to have been able to give an answer on that because I was trying to, to I was going to present that tonight in terms of what my wife and I were talking about. And so... Um, but I, I'm, I'm not going to scratch that. But what I will say for me is that I'm not trying to do anything that's going to guarantee me a seat out of heaven. I'm just going to do what I know that I have been, what I've been taught, and just going to follow that, right? What God gives me as an increase, that's exactly what I'm going to give him. And my whole thing was the tenth. There was even, and, it, and what I was really looking at was the fact that God's serious in what he's requiring of us. He's not playing. Right. And, and we want to play back with him, but he's not playing in, in that respect. We've got to be just as serious as he is to tell us something. We've got to do it or, or, or if we're taught from leadership. That's what we have to follow. Right. We've got to follow the direction that the leader is telling us. And so I'm not going to supersede your leader in the guidance that he's directing. So he may he may come back to the congregation and follow up on that. There's another question. There's one back here, too. There's one right here. So, oh, there's, okay, one right here, yes. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead with this question, but um, what about, with, uh, what about uh, with offering? Is that looked at the same as, or is that supposed to come up the heart, or, um, I don't know, I, I've never heard of there's a percentage for offering, but, okay, so yeah. that comes there, from the heart. Right, there's, there's not a percentage for offering, but if you look at Malachi, he was asking, will a man rob God? And, and, and when the question was, well, how, you, how am I going to rob you? And tithe and offerings. And so the offering has to be a free will. Mm -hmm. You know what you have in your pocket. And, and, and Bishop, I think, gave the illustration, too, of Ananias and Sapphira, right, when they came in and they both cheated. And the thing was, it was their money to do what they wanted. But you don't have to lie about it, right? You brought in and, and held back and said that's all you collected. You lied right there. Gone. You're gone. 
right? And then the two weren't talking. They have a chance to talk. So when, you know, the husband comes in, right? He said, the feet of them that carried her out is right at the door to carry. Oh, the husband, uh, the wife. The wife. Right, the wife. That's right. So the feet of them that carried your husband out is at the door to get you, right? It was because you lied. It's your money. You can give. Now, if you, if you come up tonight or whenever in the offering and you got $50 and, you know, you, you give 10 there's nothing wrong with that. But if you tell somebody that's all I have, <laughs> who you want carrying you out? <laughs> you don't have to lie, but, but be a cheerful giver, right? That's the whole premise. It's, that's the heart, the matters of the heart. Tithing, yes, offering too. Because God is asking for that. He's requiring it. He's blessed us with so much. And what we don't get in, in not talking about this enough, and we're going to get to you, Ma, um, is the fact that, pastor said it too, I have it in here. I'm, I'll probably skip over when I get to it. But he owns everything. And so, but he gives us what we have. And why would we not want to give back to him? Right? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Why? Because I have it to give. I didn't have it unless you gave it to me, Lord. So I thank you for even giving me what to give. And if I give all 50 in my pocket, the faith and trust I have in the Lord is that he's definitely going to replace it. There's a law of sowing and reaping. It's not just that you reap what you sow, but it is. You reap what you sow. Pastor Bishop Jackson has taught us plenty of times on this uh, premise and on this, this tenet. If you, get, if you plant an apple uh, tree, you're not going to grow up and get uh, oranges off of it. Okay. You know, you, you, you planting lettuce and all of a sudden you're going to get corn? No. What you sow is what you're going to give. So in the sense of money, if I give money, I should expect money. Don't try to dictate how much money now. Because what you think about in our, in our finite minds is still not what God had in store. You say, okay, God, I'm giving you 100 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm giving you $100. I want 1000 But the Lord said, well, listen, I already knew you was going to get 100 and I hadn't planned to give you 5000 But if you just want 1000 okay, then I'll just give you what you asked for. Right? And actually, what you didn't even ask for, you try to tell me what you wanted in return. Right? Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. How about asking him? Where's the respect? I know what the song says, but we, we telling God stuff, but we're not asking him about it. So, so we, you know, it's like a, a child and, and, you know, mom, dad, I want this. Wait a minute. Excuse me. Have a seat. Hold on here. Who's the parent? You don't come here telling me what you want. And sometimes I already know what it is that you want and or need. But if you want to dictate and be in the small mindset of saying, okay, I only want this, then that's maybe all I'm going to get. But not knowing the abundance of what God has in store for us. Right? But we don't practice it enough to know. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I hope I answered some of the questions. Yes, one more question. <laughs> yes. So, you briefly mentioned about um, bonuses. Um, are we tithing the same on bonuses as well? Who said bonus? I thought you did. No, no, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> no I, I didn't say bonus, but but yeah. again, all of the increase, okay. And, and if I go back to even Jacob saying, of all that you give me, all that you give me, I'm giving a tenth to you. And that, he only mentioned the tenth, but there's still an offering. Listen, I'll tell you, you know, um, I have again, I have a tax business, and so you know. As I get paid, I'm not a stickler for the money part of it all. You know, it's a business, and I should have a better business mind, but I'm just trying to help people get their taxes done on time and accurately. But I get paid, right? But I don't run after the money, right? So when I get paid, um, that's when I pay tithes on it. But And I only get, I get paid every two weeks on a regular job. But every week, my wife writes out a tithe check for me. Every week. And I didn't get money. So, you know, the whole premise of that is that if we should somehow forget, some money comes in midweek or whatever, it's covered. So we're ahead of the game. And guess what? I'm not losing when I'm giving to God. You can't lose. We can't lose when we give to God. 
right? And we're never going to outgive him. You know, and, and I don't even want to try to outgive him, but I definitely want to do my part to give him out of appreciation, right? Out of the abundance of what he's done for me, I want to be a giver. Right? I just want to be a giver. I'd rather be a giver. Lord, don't ever make me a receiver. It's fine to receive when you receive stuff, but I don't want to live a life where I'm only receiving. You know, from the one that's blessed to give. I want to be like that person. But, but I got to have a conversation with him. How is it that you can just give like you do? All of us know Deacon George Jackson, right, from Christ Church. That man, and folks, and see, here's the mentality of us. Those that know him and knew him, some folks, folks probably, I'm sure, were like, he's just bragging. But God blessed that man. If you sat and listened to a testimony, you know that he didn't have what the Lord blessed him with. One of the most lucrative businesses a person could have. One of his main contracts was the Hartford Hospital. He's a window cleaner. <laughs> he had a window cleaning business. In Hartford Hospital, nothing but glass. You never, you never stopping. You do one side, and about, you know, a couple of weeks later, you're back to the same side. You're always in business. And the Lord blessed him to do that without the conventional contracts that we do today. Some of that stuff that he got was be, be, by word of mouth. Some of the people back then when he got that contract. And now he's gone, and Sister Sheila has that business, right? She's doing a little bit more from the professional side to make sure, you know. But the word of mouth, his reputation, God blessed him for his reputation to precede him. And he was not as learned a person. He wasn't college educated. But he gave himself to the Lord. And look at how God blessed him. And he would give you what he, thank you, anything. It didn't matter to him. But yet it mattered to him. It mattered enough to him to be a giver. Because he knew that God blessed him with what he has. Right? And I'm sure there were times where Sister Jackson, Henrietta was probably, whoa, 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 whoa. But it's, if it's in a person, you got to let them go, right? Because it's coming back. Again, you sow money, money's coming back, right? So it's, it's coming back. And we can say, well, God's going to bless me with my health. Well, he'll do those things. But see, I love that. There's Matthew 6, 33. That's the, all these things will be added. But we got to seek him first and his kingdom, the lifestyle of salvation. We got to seek him first. Right? Going all the way from this here, but that's okay. All right? Yes, my question here is? Yes. Um, I don't pay tithe because of my past, my former pastor, or my pastor now tell me to pay tithe, or only that I read it. But God tell me one time, when I first got saved, and I used to make $60 a week, and I used to put $4 in the envelope and probably a dollar for offering, $4 for tithe. Because I, I have a three children and he was only me alone with the three children. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was looking at. But one day I was working and he said to me, God said to me, read Malachi chapter 3. Mm -hmm. And I look in the, play, the house where I was working and I didn't find the Bible because it was a Catholic person who lived there. They didn't have the King James like how we have it. Mm -hmm. So I waited till I go home. And when I go home, I didn't, wasn't thinking about it anymore. I hear, read Malachi chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So I go on and I read Malachi chapter 3 and he said, how do you rob me? Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. He said, how do you rob me? By tithes and offering. Yes. And I prove God for myself. I prove that it's really better to give than to receive. Amen. And from that day, I never robbed God. Come on now. I didn't know all the scripture that I knew now mm -hmm. because I was new. But I learn and I hear and, and then I follow. And I never robbed God after that. Thank Lord. Yeah, so I know it, it too, because what, the, what I was going to say before, if you said your pastor says he's going to do tent, so suppose he said he wanted to do tent, and, and my pastor said he wanted to do five, which one of them, right, because the Bible said, yeah, a tent, so it's what God said, mm -hmm. I would say what, it's what God said to give, you give, mm -hmm. a tent, mm -hmm. because I read there all about in the, and once again, I'm still saying see your, your pastor because the scriptures talk about what they did, but not so much. It was not a command. 
right? So what, what Abraham did for Melchizedek, it said he gave. Jacob said, of all that you give me, I'm going to give you. Where did he get it from? It may have been an unction of the Lord, but we don't have scripture on that. But we see in the scripture when, we, when there is a tithe mentioned, it's 10%. It's a tenth. Right. There's even such a thing as a five percent. I'm not going to go down that road. But one of the things that it almost kind of implies that if you miss paying tithe, then you owe another five percent. <laughs> you know, you owe God. Right. How many owe God right now? I'm not going to look up. But um, right. But we just want to do it God's way. Right. Here's a question up here. Um, once one second, we'll get the mic here. So, yes. But thank God for, again, what we know. It's like when you n learn better, what's the expectation? You do better, you do better right? Here, here's a testimony right here at Beulah Heights, right? And there's wisdom, there's practical testimony and knowledge there. And if we are struggling at Beulah, here's a person to come and see who didn't know, but now that she knows. And, and look, the testimony is that she, she, she's not been lacking since, right? So God will, he will honor what he said. Okay, and we are going to go to Malachi for something that I want to give an illustration for. But yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, the five percent. Where do I find that in the Bible? There's uh, a couple of parts. There's a fifth part. So what you want to do if you have a reference Bible, I don't, I, I don't have that written down here. But it references not five percent, but it talks about the fifth part. Okay. So I don't have any scripture text on that. Um, for tonight's lesson, but I can certainly pull it and do it. I can even pull it up on my phone or whatever. Some of us got those smartphones. We can pull up the fifth part and look look at the scripture references to to that. So, but it is in there. Okay. So. I have one more question. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I've been paying my tithes, and I have my son to write. He has a checking account, and I don't. Mm -hmm. So he writes it out for me, and he goes by my social security. And when I um, get the check, when I'm sitting here. Then I always give us $20 for my offering. And the Lord brought it to my mind, I have not been tithing the way I should. Mm -hmm. Because I'm taking $20 on my tithe to pay my offering. So I owe God that money back. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. God brought it to my mind that I got to, you know, get this money. I said, Lord, you know, when you get behind, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm praying, that's the Lord, how do I do this? Because I just let that 20 go for my tithe of, Pay less offering, but I know he loved the cheer forgiver. Mm -hmm. So I just want to, you know, say that I have to go back and do my tithe better. Better. Yeah. Amen. So, so note this sister again. We got examples in here tonight. What she's sharing tonight, in a few weeks, maybe a month or two, whatever it is, come back and talk to her. How's it going? Oh, I caught up and look at what God is doing. He's going to honor that, right? And again, my wife tells me something. She's told me something before, and, and it sticks with me and has stuck with me. God is only obligated to tell us one time. You know, we remind one another from time and time again. Again, he only is obligated to tell us one time. If we're not listening or we don't want to take heed, that's on us. We, we can't just go back and, would you please tell me again what it is that you, I, I forget what it all was. I can't, he, he's only obligated to tell us once which should tell us that we should be very keen on listening for what God is directing us to do, all right? I'm going to move on a couple of things here, okay? Um, oh, okay. Leviticus 27:31. Yep. I even have that in my notes on my phone, um, but I didn't, no, no. But thank you. Leviticus 27, 31. There's a couple of others in there too, I believe, that um, reference that, but definitely Leviticus is, is one of those. Okay, and so once again, you have that right here at Beulah. So again, uh, uh, bro, you can you can maybe share some of that with with her too. So all right. So listen, um, when we, again we talk about tithing being a, a, a uh, an act of worship, faith, and trust, but faith. So so if we're not paying and we're not giving and not presenting our tithes to the Lord, again, what is that saying to us? We don't trust God. Okay, we're not really fully wor worshiping Him. And we don't have faith in him, you know, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, you know, that owns everything. But we don't trust him and we don't have faith in him. And again, here's scripture. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. OK, could it be that some of us may not have been pleasing God? And so to Malachi here, and, uh, you know, we're going to be ending soon here. I know we're not going to have every 
thing. We'll pick up where we left off, um, where we don't get to complete, complete for tonight, and that's fine. But Malachi, uh, in that third chapter, the tenth verse, um, this is this is kind of my view of it. Uh, the scripture says in Malachi, it says, you know, prove me now, right? Prove me now, and see, won't I open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing? that there will not be room enough to receive it. The way that I look at this, and it may not be the, the true way, but I just, I love it because it helps me. You know, in the natural sense, you look around, you see these windows. They're, they're vertical windows, right? You open them up, you turn them to, you know, you pull them to the side or you lift them up or whatever, the windows open. When you talk about heaven, and it's a window, if that window opens, can you imagine if maybe it slides across and then what's up there pours down? And, and, and God is saying, prove me now. This is what I'm going to pour down blessings. Look at, the, look at the way that it can pour down, right? It's not lifting up a window and something has to get blown in. This is heaven. It's above us. So if a window in heaven opens up, look at what gets to pour down on us. And this is the way I'm looking. I was like, Lord, this is how you want to bless me. Now, it may not be the exact thing, but if still, if it's going to pour down from heaven, it's going to be a lot. You think about the rains. You think about the snow and all that, right? What about if he pours down his blessings upon us out of his window, right, or windows? So um, it's enough for me to say, all right, well, Lord, I'm going to do what I can to, to be all that I can to bless you and to do things your way. Right. Especially when it comes to tithing and offering. And I'm going to prove you right now. Right. I'm, I'm, I heard your voice, Lord. So I'm going to act on what I heard. And, I, and I'm going to prove you right now because you didn't tell me this for nothing. You told me this for action. OK. And so I love to look at it that way. You can, too, if you want. And that's OK. All right. God, again, he owns everything. If we believe that he owns everything, Psalm 24 and 1, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If we believe this, then we should be humbled about this fact and look forward to serving him by properly managing what he gives us according to his will. All right. And what I like in Luke 18 is a, there's another scripture in, I believe, Matthew, but Luke 18, 28 to 30. Here's Peter. This was during a lesson that Jesus was kind of warning them about the riches in the world. And, and he was, Jesus was telling them it's hard for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That was a place. That wasn't literally a, a needle. It was a place. Um, and so, you know, it, it, that's kind of how it's like for somebody to enter into heaven. It's going to be difficult for somebody um, that's really tied into your riches and all that kind of thing to enter into heaven because you're going to be so attached to that that you're going to lose sight on God. But Peter said this during, in those scriptures, Luke 18, 28. He said, Lord, we left all to follow you. <laughs> and it's like, what? Wait a minute. You, as if it's a complaint. You know, we gave up everything to follow you. And so Jesus responded to that. He was not going to let that go. I'll read this. Um, then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. 29th verse. And he said unto them, Jesus, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive many fold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. We think we give up on certain, certain things to follow Christ. And all he's, he's saying, listen, you didn't give up nothing compared to what you're going to get by giving up what you think you gave up that was more than me. Okay? There is no comparison. What I gave up in the world, listen, Bishop Jackson says and others have said too, listen, it wasn't all bad. It might have been sin, but it, wasn't all, it didn't make me feel bad. Some stuff I kind of enjoyed doing, right? But to give that up, what I have in return or replace of that is so much more. That there's no way I want to go back to that because what I have now is way better than what I thought was the feel good thing, the do good thing, even though it wasn't for my good. But I'm, I'm blessed now. I'm happy now. I'm fully satisfied. That's what blessed me, fully satisfied. And if I'm fully satisfied, I'm not looking at that, looking for that thing again. 
It doesn't satisfy me. It doesn't even have an influence on me. The drinking, the drugging, whatever it was, the sexing, the shacking, it doesn't have that same impact on me. I don't look at that now. I'm like, God, I thank you for saving me from that. I don't know where I would be today if you didn't pull me out when you did. Right? It's, it's a life of a testimony that we're grateful to the Lord for all that he's done. So it never should be, uh, you know, take Peter's stance in that scripture to be a complaint. I gave up everything to follow you. But what did you get in return? And we know the life of Peter, right? In his later life, he was so humbled by the appreciation of being with the Lord that he didn't even want to be crucified the same way. Christ on the cross said, no, turn me upside down. <laughs> I, I don't even feel worthy to be crucified in the same way that you've been crucified. If you're going to kill me, don't kill me like Christ because I'm not worthy to be killed like him. I deserve much worse, right? This is the same Peter that once said, I gave up everything. And I guarantee you if he was here to testify today, he said, listen, I, I didn't know what I was saying then, but I certainly know after walking a few miles with him, right, what I've gained in return is far better than what I said back then. I even denied him, but look at God's grace. Hallelujah. So we got four minutes, I think, on this clock. And the last thing I'm going to end with is beware of humanism. Humanism is an outlook or a system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. That's a dictionary term. I can take off the supernatural matters. I love the divine part, which is really speaking to God. We try to do things our way. We want to be our own God. We want to be our own person. I'm big and bad enough. I'm mature enough. I'm old enough. I can do it all. And I don't need God's help. You are breathing the breath that he gave you. <sighs> he gave that. <sighs> he gave that. Every breath we inhale and exhale, we, sh we can be thanking him for we would never get any work done, right? Politicians would never be able to speak in the mic because they, every time, they, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, every breath. Because all God has to do is withhold the next breath. And so beware of humanism. A simpler way to describe it is this. People believe they can do anything their own way as it seems right to them. They're not beholden to the scripture. They don't care about what the word says, but that's not us. We care about what God's word says. When we didn't know, and now we know, we don't go back to doing it the way we used to do it, right? This word is all that we have to live by, right? And so haven't we tried, the question I have in my notes here, haven't we tried things our own way long enough? You know the song, if you tried everything and everything has failed, but, but see, here's another caveat to that. Don't go trying everything. Listen to the testimonies of us that's been in and through. And don't go, okay, I can, well, they, they got drunk and, and, and went out and God brought them in. I can go drink a little bit. No, you can't. Don't go trying that, that smoke and that drink and, and that shacking. You don't know God may cut you off right then and there. Don't go trying that stuff thinking you can be better than someone. I have a sister-in-law who did that, right? She was on her way, college, and, and uh, Pratt and & Whitney, and they were paying for her college, going to be an accountant. She was going to surpass me in a short time, right? In her past, she tried marijuana. She did some of that. She quit. She figured, like, I can quit that. I, I was able to do that. Got a family. Got three young kids. My brother married, right? Life was fairly good until she decided she wanted to try crack. Never tried it before. But she went on the premise that, well, I quit marijuana. I can try this, and then, and then I can just quit. She consulted someone who used to do crack. He told her, get it out of your mind right now. Now, she was in the church, saved. And he said, the brother said, who's in the church, he said, no, rebuke that. Get it out of your mind right now. But you know how we are. We tell you what not to do, and then, you, you know, you still want to do it. It's like kids, don't do that, and then they do the thing you, you tell them don't do. So maybe it's reverse psychology. Go ahead and, and jump on that chair. And then maybe they won't. No, they're going to do it. But, but, but he told her, don't do it. I got a phone call. This is some years ago. I got a phone call one evening from my sister-in-law, and she told me, I just, I, I'm, I, I messed up. I've been doing crack for three months straight every day. 
I've been taking time off the job. Um, they're calling me to come into work. And I just, I'm, I'm kind of messed up. I said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, if I can just go through one night and not do crack, I think I'll be all right. I think I'll be on the right track. I said, what do you want me to do? My brother worked night shifts, so he wasn't going to be around. He didn't know. She didn't tell him. I said, well, listen, I'm not going to keep this to myself. Your mom doesn't know. Um, and either you get help soon or I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting this off my shoulders. I'm telling more family members. Not to tell on you, but I need to the intervention stuff, right? Family that love you. And I said, so you need one night, I'll come down. I'll tell Andre, I'm coming over. He goes to work, I'm, I'll show up right before he goes to work, okay? I came that one night, we planned. I got there, Andre was kind of surprised to see me and I still didn't tell him anything. He didn't really say, what you here for? Cause I don't come 10 o'clock at night to his house, right? Um, he didn't ask me. And I'm wondering how much does he kind of know and not know? I said, well, where's, where's your wife, right? He said, oh, she went out for a second. I'm like, I know, I know what she did. She comes back. She's got this smile on her face. I'm like, hey, I'm here. You know, we got a chance to talk. He left. I said, you, you went out and got some stuff, didn't you? She goes, yeah. I said, well, then why am I here? Right? I told her, I said, listen, you're going to miss jobs so much, they're going to tell you, okay, you don't have to come back. And when you do that, the tuition that they're paying for, they're going to say, you owe us back for what we've already paid you. Right? We're not going to invest money in you and then you not, you know. So all that I said happened. Right. My brother was encouraged by his mother in law, her mom, to get the family, the three young kids, all girls, you know, to get them out of that situation, moved out of state. He's taking care of three kids, hairs and all that kind of stuff. And he did a fantastic job, not college educated, whatever. To this day, um, she's still struggling off and on. Um, but that's my sister. I still love her and I still pray for her. But I'm saying, again, we do what we think is right for us. And we just don't ask God for help, right? And she was beautifully saved at the time. She really was. But Satan is trying to get those that he feels beautifully saved. I'm out to get you. Amen. I'm out to get you. And he ain't playing. He's not playing. I don't care how much you sing. I don't care how much you preach. I don't care. how. M I don't care. You are prime target, target for him, right? And all we have to do is say, get behind me, Satan. But we start entertaining this stuff. Well, it's not that bad. Well, come on now. Even if you didn't do it before, you know people who have done it. And the gentleman I said, don't, just, just don't. Get it out of your head. And you still feel like you can do better than him? One time you take it, and now three months every day in a row. Lost your family, Right? My brother's not here today, um, but his kids are doing well, thank God. Um, so, again, we tried things, haven't we tried things our way long enough? This is worldliness for sure. I'm ending on this note. It's worldliness for sure. And out of the words of Bishop Jackson, worldliness means attitudes and actions that leave God out. Worldliness is attitudes and actions that leave God out. And to say that now, we can question ourselves. What have I been leaving him out of? Right? And then that's worldliness. Be careful because what is leading to next. All right? So we're going to put a pin and where we start stopped to look to begin at this place next week. If your pastor will have me back, um, it's 804. And thank you, Bishop. Uh, Bishop. Prophetically, um, thank you so much, uh, Elder Brooks, for allowing us to be here. We're going to turn it over to you now. Once again, if you have questions that we weren't able to get to, you can write them down. Get them to me somehow. If you need my uh, information, I know the uh, Douglases have my contact information. Your pastor and uh, Sister Brooks has my contact information. You can call, text, uh, or, or email and information to me. We would like to answer as many questions as we possibly can, um, even during the series and certainly after. So at this time, uh, Elder Brooks, in Jesus' name. Let's say amen. I hope that was very beneficial to the congregation. Uh, but he said some, some profound things there, uh, especially I like that. I had to write it down. Worldliness is attitudes and actions that leave God out. What are you leaving God out of? 
And that's a Selah moment. So when you read that in the Psalms, it says Selah, that means stop, pause, reflect, and think. Think about what you've heard. Think about what's been said. Think about what God is saying to you. And then after you stopped, you paused, you reflected, you thought, then make a conscious decision. What am I going to do differently? What am I going to do differently? So we thank God for the word of God that was shared with us. And so he will be back next week and back the following week. Uh, and so what I would like to do is uh, you all get your questions to Sister Douglas. Yes. All right, so Sister... All right, so if you all are signed up for the... Um, text alert system, you can type, respond back to that, and it, the message will come through, and uh, we'll have your question that way, and that way we'll have questions that we can send to him he can prepare for, or uh, questions that uh, you can bring next week and ask. Amen? Amen. All right, so uh, if uh, all hearts and minds are clear, uh, why don't we bring an offering? Yes. Uh, this Friday, also, the Connecticut District Council, as you all are bringing your offering, uh, the Connecticut District Council is uh, women uh, convention.